Upon completion of this DVD, you will be able to identify the elements of a comprehensive assessment, explain the criteria for performing a comprehensive assessment on the home care patient, describe a systematic method for performing a head-to-toe nursing assessment, identify key parameters to assess in a head-to-toe assessment, name at least three components of a complete physical assessment that must be performed on each body system, which, if missed, may result in mismanagement of the patient's treatment. In home care, a comprehensive assessment combines both Medicare-mandated OASIS items as well as additional assessment details that relate to the home environment and the patient's informal support systems, taking into account the adequacy of available agency staff and services to safely meet the patient's home care needs. Just open your mouth. You have all your own teeth? Okay, no, good. I have bridge. You have bridge? Across the top. Okay. All types of home care agencies conduct a physical assessment of their patients. The extent of the assessment conducted depends on whether or not the agency is Medicare certified and consequently must comply with Medicare conditions of participation. The agency's license type, state regulations, agency policies, and standards of practice. Considerations also include confidentiality, patients' rights, and consent to treatment. In addition, for Medicare certified agencies, the Medicare conditions of participation require that a comprehensive assessment be conducted within 48 hours of referral or within 48 hours of the patient's return from a hospital or institution or on the ordered start of care date. It must accurately reflect the patient's current health status and the need for home care and include information to demonstrate progress toward desired patient outcomes. When indicated, the assessment must incorporate Medicare's OASIS items. OASIS is not meant to be a full physical assessment, but rather is integrated as a part of the whole comprehensive assessment, utilizing observation, interview, interaction with the patient and family, objective measurements, and data from other healthcare provider sources. For home care agencies not guided by OASIS, the extent of their comprehensive assessment may vary depending on the type of licensure, state, and accreditation requirements, and the clinician's own standards of practice. Primarily a nursing function, the physical assessment provides baseline data from which to draw information for the formulation of the patient's plan of care. The following home care physical assessments will focus primarily on these two patients. Infection control practices are important considerations in home care, including appropriate hand hygiene, bag technique, and standard precautions. Performing a physical assessment in the home requires compliance with all of these principles. Agencies may provide a standard bag and equipment, or the clinician may be responsible for obtaining his or her own bag and supplies. The equipment may vary depending on the needs of the clinician. Regulations require the employer to provide personal protective equipment. For example, OSHA requires PPE respirators for active TB cases and requires the employer to provide appropriate PPE in situations where blood and body fluids may pose a hazard to employees. In a home care setting, the environment is often less than ideal for performing a physical assessment. When this is the case, the clinician must improvise. Privacy is ideal, but often a caregiver is not only helpful, but vital. Other factors to consider include adequate lighting in a comfortable space, preferably where the patient can lie down, limiting distractions by turning off the TV or radio, and having pets secured in another area, facilitating patient interaction, and allowing the clinician to conduct the physical assessment properly. Establishing trust and a working relationship with the patient is critical to the accurate collection of data from the assessment process. Bedbound patients or patients with dementia pose a particular challenge to home care clinicians. But by utilizing appropriate assessment techniques and involving the families and primary caregivers, these patients too can be adequately assessed. Prior to conducting the physical assessment, it's valuable to obtain a thorough health history. When possible, review the patient's past history, establishing the current problem that needs to be addressed for home care. Identify any patient allergies, 
Obtain the patient's height and weight as reported by the patient and preferably confirmed by measurement later. Complete a thorough medication drug regimen review. Other OASIS items collected prior to or during the visit not specific to physical assessment are clinical record items and patient identification items, MU010 to MU100, demographics and patient history, MU140 to MU290, living arrangements, MU300 to MU340, supportive assistance, MU350 to MU380, Therapy need, MU825. Emergent care, MU830 to MU855. And discharge disposition information, MU870 to MU906. In home care, a comprehensive assessment combines both Medicare-mandated OASIS items, as well as additional assessment details that relate to the home environment and the patient's informal support systems taking into account the adequacy of available agency staff and services to safely meet the patient's home care needs. In addition, for Medicare certified agencies, the Medicare conditions of participation require that a comprehensive assessment be conducted within 48 hours of referral or within 48 hours of the patient's return from a hospital or institution or on the ordered start of care date. It must accurately reflect the patient's current health status and the need for home care and include information to demonstrate progress toward desired patient outcomes. When indicated, the assessment must incorporate Medicare's OASIS items. OASIS is not meant to be a full physical assessment, but rather is integrated as a part of the whole comprehensive assessment utilizing observation, interview, interaction with the patient and family, objective measurements, and data from other healthcare provider sources. Prior to conducting the physical assessment, it's valuable to obtain a thorough health history. When possible, review the patient's past history, establishing the current problem that needs to be addressed for home care. Identify any patient allergies. Obtain the patient's height and weight as reported by the patient and preferably confirmed by measurement later. Complete a thorough medication drug regimen review. The actual physical assessment is a head-to-toe systems review. In the Medicare agency, this includes specific OASIS items that must be completed. The assessment is done by a combination of inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, interview, observation, and measurement. OASIS items will be identified on screen when applicable. The appropriate MU item will be shown on the screen for reference. The assessment starts first with the patient's general appearance, then proceeds to specific systems. The clinician may begin with vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, respirations, temperature, as a way to build the patient's trust and confidence. This gives the clinician an overview of posture, motor behavior, dress, grooming, and personal hygiene, which we will return to later in the video. Then the clinician starts a head-to-toe assessment. Inquire about any dizziness or headaches and assess the head for swelling or tenderness, hair color, texture, and distribution. Do you have any cataracts or glaucoma? I had cataract surgery about two years ago. Right or left eye? Both eyes. Okay, so they're surgically repaired? Yes. Okay, good. Inquire about glaucoma and cataracts. Check pupil reaction to light, whether they respond equally and assess peripheral vision. Determine if the patient can read medication labels or admission forms. Find out if the patient uses glasses or contacts. Rosie, can you please tell uh, Sarita that I'm going to be uh, checking her vital signs, checking her blood pressure, her temperature, and her pulse, uh, since we're already done with the paperwork? It is important to assess the patient's ability to understand spoken language. If there are language difficulties, determine the need for translation and or a caregiver for accurate assessment. Jack, how is your hearing? I need hearing aid. Okay, both ears? Both ears, yes. And you have them in today, good. Also check for hearing aid use, right and left, and check for earwax. Administering a whisper test may also be beneficial. Assess for aphasia and comprehension. 
Assess the nose and sinus for appearance, obstruction or patency, any discharge, pain or tenderness, bleeding and color. For the neck and throat, assess for the following. Frown smile facial symmetry, swelling, lymph nodes, carotid artery and jugular veins, hoarseness, ability to swallow. Assess the tongue and gums, teeth and dentures. Look for evidence of thrush, ulcerations, a gag reflex and presence of or a scar from a tracheostomy or previous surgeries. Note any assistive devices the patient may currently use such as sheepskins, pressure pads, special beds or other durable medical equipment or DME. If none are in use, consider their need as you assess the integrity of the skin. This item refers to the presence of a skin lesion or open wound. Skin assessment includes skin color, presence of moles, infection, skin lesions, bruises, masses, scars, rashes, incisions, and discolorations. For OASIS purposes, any ostomy or peripheral IV access site is not considered a skin lesion. Assessment of invasive items include entrance or exit sites of peripheral catheters, peripherally inserted central catheters or PICs, other central venous access devices, and access sites for enteral nutrition, such as a G-tube or J-tube. Therapies the patient receives at home, such as IV infusion, TPN or enteral nutrition, and the presence of ostomies are noted as well. Skin assessment also includes assessing for the presence of pressure ulcers. If present, further clarification is indicated. The clinician must observe for and document the number and stages of observable pressure ulcers and the status of the most problematic pressure ulcer, documenting the degree of healing visible. Also document the presence of healed pressure ulcers as this skin area is susceptible to breakdown. The clinician must also assess for the presence of a stasis ulcer, the number of observable stasis ulcers, if there are any unobservable stasis ulcers, and the status of the most problematic observed stasis ulcer, describing the degree of healing present. If the patient has a surgical wound, and this includes infusion access sites, assessment and documentation should reflect the number of surgical wounds, whether any are unable to be observed due to the presence of a non-removable dressing, and the status of the most problematic surgical wound, identifying the degree of healing visible. I'm gonna check and see how hydrated you are, how much fluid you're getting in, make sure you're getting enough and that you're not dehydrated. I just pinch your skin a little bit and see how fast it returns back to normal. Skin turgor is also evaluated. Does the patient experience pruritus or itching? Is there abnormal presence of hair? Assess the toes and fingernails for color and quality of nails. Patients receiving chemotherapy may have specific skin and hair issues. Wound care and prevention of decubitus ulcers in home care can be a challenge. Accurate assessment of the patient's skin will provide a baseline for preventive measures to be taken to foster good patient outcomes. Patient and caregiver education regarding prevention strategies is vital. Use of the patient's own bed and supplies must be considered along with whether appropriate durable medical equipment is necessary for the patient's care. The assessment starts first with the patient's general appearance, then proceeds to specific systems. The clinician may begin with vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, respirations, temperature, as a way to build the patient's trust and confidence. This gives the clinician an overview of posture, motor behavior, dress, grooming, and personal hygiene, which we will return to later in the video. This item refers to the presence of a skin lesion or open wound. Skin assessment includes skin color, presence of moles, infection, skin lesions, bruises, masses, scars, rashes, incisions, and discolorations. For OASIS purposes, any ostomy or peripheral IV access site is not considered a skin lesion. The cardiorespiratory system is composed of the circulatory system's heart and blood vessels and the respiratory system, including nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and lungs, delivering oxygenated blood to the entire body. 
Cardiovascular disease is one of the most frequent conditions seen in home care. To assess the cardiorespiratory system, check the patient's vital signs, including temperature, blood pressure, both on the right and the left. If the patient's diagnosis is cardiac in nature, assess the blood pressure with the patient lying, sitting, and standing. Assess the patient's pulses, apical, brachial, radial, popliteal, and pedal. Assess for rhythm and quality, and measure the rate, rhythm, and depth of respirations. Are you having any shortness of breath when you're walking? A little bit. Okay. Oasis item MU490 requires documentation of when the patient is dyspneic or noticeably short of breath. And MU500 asks what respiratory treatments are utilized at home, including oxygen, ventilators, or CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Assess for dyspnea on rest, exertion, palpitations, murmurs, claudication, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, chest pain, fatigue, orthopnea, document the number of pillows used, cyanosis, presence of a pacemaker, any varicosities, and other cardiac problems. Edema can be measured with a standard tape measure for accurate assessment. Assessment of breathing patterns includes whether the patient uses pursed lip breathing techniques. In further assessing the patient's breath sounds, the clinician assesses whether there are strider, crackles, or ronchi, wheezes, or plural rubs heard on auscultation. Does the patient have a cough? Is it a productive new cough or a chronic cough? Assess the frequency of coughs and assess the sputum. Ask about night sweats. Does the patient have a history of asthma? Assess for shortness of breath, MU490, and endurance. Jack, are you using your walker when you're here alone fairly consistently yes, to I prevent do. falls? Yes, I do. Good. Yes. Are you having any shortness of breath when you're walking? A little bit. Is the patient able to ambulate greater than 20 feet, less than 20 feet, climbing stairs, dressing, eating, talking, or are they short of breath at rest? These items may also impact on the patient's homebound status, a required assessment for eligibility for Medicare services at home. Respiratory Treatments MU500 identifies the type of treatments the patient receives at home, and MU790, Management of Inhalant Mist Medications, assesses the patient's ability to prepare and take all prescribed treatments and medications. If the patient is receiving oxygen, assess the patient's oxygen use. How frequently do they use the oxygen and at what flow rate? Assess and document the amount in liters per minute or LPM, whether it is continuous or on an intermittent PRN basis, how it is administered, nasal cannula or mask, and what situations require it. If possible, determine their oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter. The clinician should instruct both patients and families on home oxygen safety. Be sure appropriate signage is clearly visible in the home, warning of oxygen use and advising no smoking. A breast exam is most conveniently performed after the cardio assessment while the chest area is exposed. It should be done in both males and females, but less extensive in the male. Assess for lumps, tenderness, discharge, and pain. While assessing, the clinician can also educate the patient on self-breast exam. The musculoskeletal system provides shape and support to the body, allows for movement, and protects the internal organs. It contributes to the production of red blood cells, assists the circulation of blood in the body, and stores calcium and phosphorus in the bones. As part of the musculoskeletal assessment, observe the patient dressing, putting on shoes, combing hair, bending, sitting, and ambulating. Assess for edema. Assess for any history of arthritis, gout, joint pain, swelling, or stiffness. Assess for weakness, muscle strength, the presence of an amputation or prosthesis. Observe the legs, including extremity temperatures and deformities. Assess the use of durable medical equipment, DME, devices, such as a walker, cane, wheelchair, and commode. And assess ambulation, holding on to walls, furniture, devices, steadiness, distance tolerance, and breathing status. Assess the patient's history of falls, their frequency, and any associated injury. Identify the patient's rehabilitation prognosis for their functional status for MU270. 
When she has pain, where does she have pain? Cuando tienes dolor, donde tienes dolor? And assess for pain, frequency of pain that interferes with the patient's activity or movement, move 420. And intractable pain, that which is not easily relieved, occurs at least daily. What triggers the pain? It's hard to say. I sometimes wake up, uh, get out of bed with... And affects the patient's sleep, appetite, physical or emotional energy, concentration, personal relationships, emotions, or the ability or desire to perform physical activity. Move 430. In a non-verbal patient, assessment of pain includes observing facial expressions, behavior, and vital signs changes. The musculoskeletal assessment includes assessing for homebound status for the Medicare agencies. As one of the requirements for Medicare to cover home care services, a patient must be considered essentially confined to their place of residence. Psychiatric patients who may not safely be out on their own may also qualify as homebound. Homebound status would also be a part of the clinician's assessment under the Neuro-Emotional Behavioral System Review. The neurological system acts as the main circuit board for the body. It allows interaction with the external environment through stimulation of nerve endings, provides the interpretation of these impulses, and directs the body's reaction to these stimulants. It also maintains the activities of the internal organs. The neurological assessment includes headaches, dizziness, syncope, seizures, paralysis, leg cramps, numbness or tingling, tremors, aphasia or inarticulate speech, assessing for a comatose state, and a pain assessment. When she has pain, where does she have pain? Cuando tienes dolor, donde tienes dolor? Regularmente en, en my back y en mi pecho. For all patients, a pain assessment is necessary. In many states, pain is now considered to be the fifth vital sign and is a required component of the patient's assessment. Even if not required by regulation, pain assessment is a critical component of any physical assessment. Jack, I'm going to show you a chart that has faces on it to help you decide what your level of pain is. Sometimes it's easier looking at faces. The chart has a happy face and it goes all the way down to a sad face. You look at the chart and tell me what level of pain you're having in your lower back. I'd say the second one, number two. Number two. Many types of pain rating scales may be used, but they must be used consistently and reassessed frequently. Assessing pain in a non-verbal patient involves observation of behavior, vital signs changes, or the use of visual pain scales. Pain interferes with functioning, and if properly controlled, patients can function and participate in their plan of care with optimum outcomes. OASIS items MOO 420, frequency of pain interfering with patient's activity or movement, and MOO 430, intractable pain, identifies how pain affects the patient's ability to function with activities. Pain may affect the patient causing depression, therefore MOO 590 may be assessed as well. As part of the musculoskeletal assessment, observe the patient dressing, putting on shoes, combing hair, bending, sitting, and ambulating. Assess for edema. Assess for any history of arthritis, gout, joint pain, swelling, or stiffness. Assess for weakness, muscle strength, the presence of an amputation or prosthesis. Observe the legs, including extremity temperatures and deformities. Assess the patient's history of falls, their frequency, and any associated injury. Identify the patient's rehabilitation prognosis for their functional status for MU270. The neurological assessment includes headaches, dizziness, syncope, seizures, paralysis, leg cramps, numbness or tingling, tremors, aphasia or inarticulate speech, assessing for a comatose state, and a pain assessment. When she has pain, where does she have pain? Cuando tienes dolor, donde tienes dolor? Regularmente en, en my back. For all patients, a pain assessment is necessary. In many states, pain is now considered to be the fifth vital sign and is a required component of the patient's assessment. Even if not required by regulation, pain assessment is a critical component of any physical assessment. 
Jack, I'm going to show you a chart that has faces on it to help you decide what your level of pain is. Sometimes it's easier looking at faces. The chart has a happy face and it goes all the way down to a sad face. You look at the chart and tell me what level of pain you're having in your lower back. I'd say the second one, number two. Number two. Many types of pain rating scales may be used, but they must be used consistently and reassessed frequently. Assessing pain in a nonverbal patient involves observation of behavior, vital signs changes, or the use of visual pain scales. Pain interferes with functioning, and if properly controlled, patients can function and participate in their plan of care with optimum outcomes. OASIS items MU420, frequency of pain interfering with patient's activity or movement, and MU430, intractable pain, identifies how pain affects the patient's ability to function with activities. Pain may affect the patient causing depression, therefore MU590 may be assessed as well. The genitourinary system allows for the excretion of the body's waste products and helps the body maintain water and electrolyte balance. The system also supports the body's reproductive system and in functioning, including hormonal production and sexual functioning. The genitourinary segment of the assessment is done in conjunction with the abdominal exam while the patient is lying flat. The patient should have emptied his or her bladder first. Inspection auscultation of sounds and percussion may be used to assess the genitourinary system as urinary retention or stress incontinence can be discovered during auscultation and percussion of the abdomen. However, most information may be obtained simply by asking. The genitourinary assessment includes assessing for urinary tract infection within the past 14 days, MU510 symptoms of urinary frequency, MU520 urinary incontinence and the frequency of incontinence, indicating when the incontinence occurs for MU530 nocturia, pain, hematuria, urgency. If the patient has anuria or an ostomy for urinary drainage, this is marked for OASIS as a no incontinence or catheter for MU520 urinary incontinence or urinary catheter presence. While assessing these areas, aspects of the patient's ability to get to and from the toilet or commode, MU680, can also be determined. If a catheter is present, either a Foley or a suprapubic, document the date of the last change, the catheter size, and balloon size. In addition, the GU system includes an assessment of gender-specific issues. For males, assess for prostate problems and sexual dysfunction. For females, assess for any history of hysterectomy or dysmenorrhea, the date of her last pap test, any contraception use, and any estrogen replacement therapy that may be used. Ascertain the woman's pregnancy history, including gravita and para. For both males and females, assess for any sexual functioning issues as appropriate and sexually transmitted disease symptoms. The gastrointestinal system is responsible for the digestion of food for energy for the body, absorption of minerals, and elimination of solid waste products. The gastrointestinal tract assessment requires an assessment of the patient's abdomen, preferably while the patient is lying flat. Inspection, auscultation of bowel sounds, observation, percussion, and palpation are used. Height and weight are measured. The clinician should determine the date of the last bowel movement, frequency of bowel movements, whether there is a feeding tube or ostomy. If there is, the date of surgery, type of appliance, and site, and who cares for it should be documented. Assess for indigestion, nausea, vomiting, ulcers, flatulence, distension, pain, hernia, diarrhea or constipation, rectal bleeding, hemorrhoids, gallbladder, gallstones, and jaundice. OASIS items MU540, bowel incontinence frequency, identifies only the frequency of incontinence, not treatment or constipation. MU550, ostomy for bowel elimination, identifies whether the patient has an ostomy for bowel elimination and whether it is related to a recent inpatient stay or a change in medical treatment. The endocrine hematopoietic system is comprised of the organs of the body that produce hormones that regulate many functions of the body. 
These products preserve homeostasis in order to keep the body functioning at an optimum level. Disorders of these organs can cause many of the diseases for which patients are treated at home, such as diabetes. For the endocrine hematopoietic system, assess for diabetes. Identify if the patient experiences any polyuria or polydipsia. Thyroid disorders can be assessed by palpation of the thyroid and is usually done in the head-neck exam. Bleeding or bruising and tolerance to heat or cold may be indicators of disorders in this system. The physician may order certain blood tests in order to validate the findings of disorders suspected on this physical assessment. How's your appetite doing? Uh, it's fair. Fair, Only okay. Fair. You realize that you're getting most of your nutrition, the majority of it through your TPN because yes. of the problems you have with the digestive right. tract? Okay. Assessing nutritional status may require more than other systems assessments. The input of a caregiver. Assess the patient's weight, measured when possible, in the same place at the same hour of the day for future consistency, or at least be sure to document the time of day. Identify and document any weight loss or gain, any change in appetite, nausea or vomiting. Identify pain, loss of teeth, poorly fitting dentures. Identify the type of diet, who prepares the meals, and any particular meal patterns. Assess for the presence of a feeding tube. If present, document the type, the formula used, the frequency and amount of feedings, and identify for the amount of fluids ingested and whether or not there are any fluid restrictions. As long as your meals are prepared and brought to you, you're able to feed yourself, am I correct? Yes. Okay. And you are preparing some meals yourself? Yes, I do. Good, you're being careful in the kitchen with the gas? Oh, of course. Beautiful. A 24-hour recall diet history is a useful tool in assessing nutritional status. Some agencies may have access to a registered dietitian or nutritionist for consultation in instances when a nutritional deficit is suspected. Oasis items Moo 710, Feeding Eating, the patient's ability to feed self meals, Moo 720, Planning and Preparation of Light Meals, that is the patient's ability to independently plan and prepare his or her own meals, Moo 780, Management of Oral Meds, the patient's ability to prepare and take all prescribed oral medications safely and reliably, and Moo 250, Therapies the patient receives at home, including IV fluids, parenteral nutrition or enteral nutrition are assessed and documented. Any episodes of depression, feelings of sadness? Sometimes I Sometimes. have some depression. You're, you're still pretty much alone during the day, aren't you? Yes, I am. Do you think it might help to have a social worker come in and talk with you? It's hard to say, possibly. Mm -hmm. It probably wouldn't hurt. The neuro-emotional behavioral status of the patient is assessed to identify those mental processes or thoughts that may interfere with the individual's ability to reach optimal level of functioning. Observation of the patient throughout the assessment process, as well as interview strategies and data collection from the patient and patient's family, medical team, and health history, all contribute to the assessment process. Document the patient's orientation to person, place, and time. The OASIS items in the Neuro-Emotional Behavioral section, MOO 560 to MOO 630, assess the patient's current level of alertness, orientation, comprehension, concentration, and immediate memory. They assess for confusion, anxiety, depression, and problematic behaviors the patient may be experiencing that reflect alterations in the patient's cognitive or neuro-emotional status. Both interview and observation may be used in answering these OASIS items. Assessment of a problem with the patient's hygiene may indicate a patient's emotional problem may be affecting his or her everyday functioning. Assessment aspects of the patient's homebound status would also be appropriate for this segment of physical assessment. Psychiatric patients under Medicare may be considered to be homebound if their illness manifests itself in a refusal to leave the home or if leaving the home unattended would not be considered safe even if the patient has no physical limitations. Documentation of this situation would be required. What kind of things is Carmen having to help you with? Does she help you with your bathing? 
yes, she helps me with the bathing uh, 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 to the extent that she uh, uh, stands by. Okay. Uh, I don't need any help actual bathing, but she stands by in case of an accident. So you're able to totally wash yourself now? Yes. Good, good. And she's just there. And is she, does she prepare your meals in the evening? Generally, I prepare my own, but she serves it, uh, she serves it to me. Oh, but you're doing the cooking? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Levels of functioning are an important factor in the patient's ability to remain at home. The assessment of the patient's functional ability include activities of daily living, or ADLs, and instrumental activities of daily living, IADLs. ADLs are those basic self-care activities like bathing, dressing, grooming, and toileting. IADLs are those activities that support the ADLs and provide for independent living, and they require some degree of both cognitive and physical ability, such as shopping, housekeeping, laundry, use of a telephone, and managing medication and equipment. The functional assessment is meant to be a combination of interview, observation, and direct practice of skills. Patients frequently overestimate their ability to do ADLs. Direct observation of these activities are the best way to assess the patient's ability to perform ADLs and IADLs and leads to greater inter-rater reliability of assessments when done by clinicians of different disciplines. The OASIS items in the ADL-IADL segment provide a way for the clinician to document the patient's ability to function at home. The patient's ability is judged on the day of the assessment, choosing the response that best describes the patient more than 50% of the time during that visit. Direct observation, supplemented by interview, is the best way to complete these OASIS items. It should be noted that MU780 excludes injectable and IV meds and is the patient's ability to manage oral meds, not their compliance or willingness. MU800, management of injectable meds, excludes IV meds. MU810 and MU820, the OASIS items involved with the management of equipment by the patient and caregivers, includes only oxygen, IV infusion therapy, and enteral or parenteral nutrition equipment or supplies. Again, these questions relate to ability, not willingness or compliance. MU825, therapy needed, addresses the anticipated outcome of the full patient assessment as it relates to the need for PT, OT, and or SLP. It determines whether or not the patient's care plan indicates a need for high therapy use, 10 or more therapy visits in the episode of care. While conducting the assessment, observation of the patient's environment is a component of the process. Patient safety is a major concern for all home care clinicians. The goal is to establish and maintain a safe home environment. You have a first aid kit there, great. Yes, my daughter bought that for me. Beautiful. And do you frequently check your battery? Oh, I check in the it flashlight to make sure everything's working? Okay, just to make sure it's working so yeah. if the electricity goes off, you have light. Yes. Good. Recognizing and handling medical and non-medical emergencies is another component of the home care assessment. Emergency planning and preparation is very important to the safety of the patient and their family. Can you please let her know that this is the safety and emergency preparedness checklist? It tells her about the stairs, the hallways, um, your setup of your uh, furniture, the lights, the bathroom safety, kitchen safety, electrical safety. Disaster preparedness plans must be addressed with the patient and the family in advance. Agencies must have plans in place when disasters occur to assure that needed care can be obtained for the patient. States have emergency management personnel who can assist with patient emergency plans when needed, but arrangements should be made in advance. Patients in the terminal phase of life are often treated at home. Medicare has a hospice benefit that provides for significant assistance in the last six months of life for patients who elect the Medicare hospice benefit. OASIS is not required for patients who elect the hospice benefit under a Medicare certified hospice program. 
However, a comprehensive assessment is still a key component for all patients who may be in the terminal stage of their life, regardless of whether or not they select the hospice benefit. Pain and palliative care management is thus a critical component of terminal home care. Oasis items for those patients under the regular Medicare certified agency to be considered are MOO 260 prognosis. The best description of the patient's overall prognosis for recovery from this episode of illness. MOO 270 rehabilitative prognosis. The best description of the patient's expected prognosis for functional status improvement and MU280, life expectancy, an informed judgment by the clinician of the patient's life expectancy within a six-month time frame. This OASIS item does not have to have physician documentation in order for the clinician to make this judgment. Asking oneself, would it surprise me if this patient expired within six months, may help to answer this OASIS question. The home care clinician and agency can be assured that with the elements of a physical assessment done by the appropriate clinician, the patient will receive the benefit of a coordinated, comprehensive approach to their home care needs. Consideration of the patient's health, adequacy of the home environment, safety, participation of informal support systems, and availability of agency staff and services will serve both agency and patient well in the provision of care where most people want it in their own home. The genitourinary assessment includes assessing for urinary tract infection within the past 14 days, MU510 symptoms of urinary frequency, MU520 urinary incontinence and the frequency of incontinence, indicating when the incontinence occurs for MU530, nocturia, pain, hematuria, urgency. If a catheter is present, either a Foley or a suprapubic, Document the date of the last change, the catheter size, and balloon size. In addition, the GU system includes an assessment of gender-specific issues. For males, assess for prostate problems and sexual dysfunction. For females, assess for any history of hysterectomy or dysmenorrhea, the date of her last pap test, any contraception use, and any estrogen replacement therapy that may be used. Ascertain the woman's pregnancy history, including gravita and para. For both males and females, assess for any sexual functioning issues as appropriate and sexually transmitted disease symptoms. The clinician should determine the date of the last bowel movement, frequency of bowel movements, whether there is a feeding tube or ostomy. If there is, the date of surgery, type of appliance, and site, and who cares for it should be documented. Assess for indigestion, nausea, vomiting, ulcers, flatulence, distension, pain, hernia, diarrhea or constipation, rectal bleeding, hemorrhoids, gallbladder, gallstones, and jaundice. Oasis Items MU540, Bowel Incontinence Frequency, identifies only the frequency of incontinence, not treatment or constipation. MU 550, ostomy for bowel elimination, identifies whether the patient has an ostomy for bowel elimination and whether it is related to a recent inpatient stay or a change in medical treatment. Any episodes of depression, feelings of sadness? Sometimes I sometimes. have some depression. You're, you're still pretty much alone during the day, aren't you? Yes, I am. Do you think it might help to have a social worker come in and talk with you? It's hard to say, possibly. Mm -hmm. It probably wouldn't hurt. The neuro-emotional behavioral status of the patient is assessed to identify those mental processes or thoughts that may interfere with the individual's ability to reach optimal level of functioning. Observation of the patient throughout the assessment process, as well as interview strategies and data collection from the patient and patient's family medical team, and health history all contribute to the assessment process. Document the patient's orientation to person, place, and time. The OASIS items in the Neuro-Emotional Behavioral section, MU560 to MU630, assess the patient's current level of alertness, orientation, comprehension, concentration, and immediate memory. They assess for confusion, anxiety, depression, and problematic behaviors the patient may be experiencing that reflect alterations in the patient's cognitive or neuro-emotional status. 
both interview and observation may be used in answering these OASIS items. The functional assessment is meant to be a combination of interview, observation, and direct practice of skills. Patients frequently overestimate their ability to do ADLs. Direct observation of these activities are the best way to assess the patient's ability to perform ADLs and IADLs and leads to greater inter-rater reliability of assessments when done by clinicians of different disciplines. The OASIS items in the ADL-IADL segment provide a way for the clinician to document the patient's ability to function at home. The patient's ability is judged on the day of the assessment, choosing the response that best describes the patient more than 50% of the time during that visit. Direct observation, supplemented by interview, is the best way to complete these OASIS items. It should be noted that MU780 excludes injectable and IV meds and is the patient's ability to manage oral meds, not their compliance or willingness. MU800, management of injectable meds, excludes IV meds. MU810 and MU820, the OASIS items involved with the management of equipment by the patient and caregivers, includes only oxygen, IV infusion therapy, and enteral or parenteral nutrition equipment or supplies. Again, these questions relate to ability, not willingness or compliance. MU825, therapy needed, addresses the anticipated outcome of the full patient assessment as it relates to the need for PT, OT, and or SLP. It determines whether or not the patient's care plan indicates a need for high therapy use, 10 or more therapy visits in the episode of care. Other OASIS items collected prior to or during the visit, not specific to physical assessment, are clinical record items and patient identification items, MU010 to MU100, demographics and patient history, MU140 to MU290, living arrangements, MU300 to MU340, supportive assistance, MU350 to MU380, Therapy need, MU825. Emergent care, MU830 to MU855. And discharge disposition information, MU870 to MU906. Assess for edema. Assess for any history of arthritis, gout, joint pain, swelling, or stiffness. Assess for weakness, muscle strength, the presence of an amputation or prosthesis, Observe the legs, including extremity temperatures and deformities. In many states, pain is now considered to be the fifth vital sign and is a required component of the patient's assessment. If a catheter is present, either a Foley or a suprapubic, document the date of the last change, the catheter size, and balloon size. In addition, the GU system includes an assessment of gender-specific issues. For males, Assess for prostate problems and sexual dysfunction. For females, assess for any history of hysterectomy or dysmenorrhea, the date of her last pap test, any contraception use, and any estrogen replacement therapy that may be used. Ascertain the woman's pregnancy history, including gravita and para. For both males and females, assess for any sexual functioning issues as appropriate and sexually transmitted disease symptoms. The clinician should determine the date of the last bowel movement, frequency of bowel movements, whether there is a feeding tube or ostomy. If there is, the date of surgery, type of appliance, and site. 
and who cares for it should be documented. Assess for indigestion, nausea, vomiting, ulcers, flatulence, distension, pain, hernia, diarrhea or constipation, rectal bleeding, hemorrhoids, gallbladder, gallstones, and jaundice. Oasis Items MOO 540, Bowel Incontinence Frequency, identifies only the frequency of incontinence, not treatment or constipation. MOO 550, Ostomy for Bowel Elimination, identifies whether the patient has an ostomy for bowel elimination and whether it is related to a recent inpatient stay or a change in medical treatment. The neuro-emotional behavioral status of the patient is assessed to identify those mental processes or thoughts that may interfere with the individual's ability to reach optimal level of functioning. Observation of the patient throughout the assessment process as well as interview strategies and data collection from the patient and patient's family, medical team, and health history all contribute to the assessment process. The functional assessment is meant to be a combination of interview, observation, and direct practice of skills. Patients frequently overestimate their ability to do ADLs. Direct observation of these activities are the best way to assess the patient's ability to perform ADLs and IADLs and leads to greater inter-rater reliability of assessments when done by clinicians of different disciplines.